where this marks the 10th anniversary of the Women's March for Equality. And in order of that, we begin tonight a series of reports, uh, a series of reports with Cube reporter Lori Segrist, who talked to women who have traditionally male jobs. Now, tonight's topic is particularly appropriate because Lori discovers that it's not always the man that holds the reins. When, I, when you first start out, is men don't trust women. You know, it's like we're supposed to be, I don't know, they think we're lower than them or we're not as strong as they are or, or what it is, but a lot of men don't trust women with their horses and it's tough to get a stable going, you know. But um, I think if you, sh you can show them that, that you're capable, then, you know, it's all right. 32-year-old Debbie Evelsizer was runner-up in the Ohio segment of the Miss World contest back in 1965. Now, 15 years later, she is a harness racer, horse trainer, and stable owner. Debbie is one of only three women out of some 300 harness racers at Scioto Downs, just south of Columbus. How did you get interested in harness racing in the first place? I was going to the races pretty regular, and um, I met my husband, and we... I'd come to the barn and would watch him, you know, and it intrigued me, and I started coming to the barn more and more and more, and, and uh, I started helping him clean the stalls and, you know, giving the horses baths, and the more you get into it, the more you love it. You either really love it or you hate it, and I loved it. <laughs> what kind of a day do you put in? Well, it's hard work. You have to get up early in the morning and be here the majority of the day. And uh, you feed your horses and you take them out and jog them and exercise them and train them and clean their stalls and bathe them and do their legs up, pack their feet, you know, keep their harnesses clean, keep their feed tubs and water buckets cleaned out. And we f I feed my horses four times a day, so someone has to be here to, to feed four times a day. And uh, then it... You know, usually we're usually done by one, two o'clock, and I usually go home and take a nap because I'm so tired. And then on the nights that I race, I come back. I'm usually back here by five or six o'clock, and then we race. We have to go, you know, get our horse, take him and warm him up and harness him up, and you know, and then we race. The only day that really is free is our Sundays, and I try to, you know, cook a meal on Sundays or do something you know with my daughter but she comes with me to the barn quite a bit that keeps her out of trouble and and she's learning too you know so she she comes with me quite a bit and my husband he races at the Meadowlands and he comes back and forth about every two weeks the greatest challenge is to have your horses race well and for them to win or at least get checks pay their way it makes me happy it makes their owners happy and um that's the biggest challenge is for the horses to race well. What if they what if they lose? Then you don't you don't get a check then. Well, if they for, they have to finish in the top 5 and they get checks in the top 5. But it's better to win. <laughs> the best of course is to win. Is there anything in the job that you need a man to do for you? Is there anything in the job that you need a man to do for you? No. <laughs> I can handle it all. <laughs> Dr. Carol Miller is a neurosurgeon, associate professor, and researcher at University Hospital, as well as being a loyal fan of the Detroit Tigers. Neurosurgeons are concerned with the surgical problems, such as brain tumors. Uh, much of what we do has to do with trauma, uh, head injuries, uh, blood clots uh, in the brain, secondary to head injuries, spinal cord injuries, uh, trauma to the spine, and trauma to the peripheral nerves, and then just a whole host of uh, other diseases that affect the central nervous system. Can you describe one of the more difficult sorts of surgery you perform? A more difficult type of operation is one down here around one of these peripheral nerves. Occasionally tumors occur on this particular nerve and cause uh, hearing loss and uh, uh, sometimes facial palsy on one side of the face and can eventually involve the vital centers of the brain, the brain stem. And uh, we approach this by going uh, through what we call the posterior fossa and lift up the cerebellum to get to the tumor and attempt to remove it.
Fourteen of Dr. Miller's 44 years were spent in college in training to be a neurosurgeon. She always knew she wanted to be a doctor, but it wasn't until she was in medical school that she decided to become a neurosurgeon. During my uh, uh, sophomore and junior year, I hadn't had any clinical rotations yet, and I was uh, fortunate enough to... Uh, to get an externship at Mount Carmel Hospital. I had worked there the previous summer in surgery as a scrub tech, and I uh, was lucky enough to get the externship, and the first place they put me was on St. Vincent's, which is the fifth floor, and it happened to be neuro the neurosurgery floor, because basically because none of the other interns or anyone wanted to work there. I didn't know that was supposed to be tough. So they just put me there and said, here you are, kid, this floor is all yours. And I said, oh, gee, great. And it happened to be the, uh, and as I said, it was the neurosurgery ward. And uh, at the end of the summer, I loved it. What's the greatest challenge for you in the job? The greatest challenge is uh, still just the uh, technical, in neurosurgery, is, is the technical aspects of neurosurgery and just being... Um, a good neurosurgeon and coming up to my own, what I think a neurosurgeon should be in terms of, uh, of being able to do a good operation. And I'm still developing my skills. What there. do you think a good neurosurgeon should be? Well, in terms of uh, the technical aspects, uh, I just want to be able to operate the best I can and perform um, those operations that. Uh, that other people you know, do very well, I want to do as well or better. What, what's the toughest part of the job then? The most difficult part was to uh, have to talk to young parents you know, about my own age or so and tell them that their beautiful children or their beautiful child had just you know, been run over by a car or had a terrible brain injury and was not going to survive or to deal with the uh, congenital anomalies which you know the children are not going to get better and it's going to drag on for years and often even split up families and that sort of thing. For me, that's, that's the most unrewarding part of neurosurgery. How do your male colleagues and superiors treat you? Frankly, personally, I've never really come up against any prejudice. I've always been feeded, treated really, I think, just like everybody else. Uh, Neurosurgery is difficult whether you're a male or a female, and I don't think it's any more difficult if you're a female than a male. For Dr. Miller, an easy day is one of 12 hours, and a more difficult one might be 18. A busy day um, might start as early as 2 o'clock in the morning with an emergency uh, operation, uh, or uh, I may come in at 6.30 to make rounds with, uh, before a 7.30 uh, lecture, say, to the students and then uh, surgery uh, most of that, most of the day. Um, some days I see patients in the outpatient clinic. Some days are primarily uh, tied up in uh, uh, teaching responsibilities. Uh, I just finished the uh, phase three curriculum. That's about three months of uh, the medical school curriculum. Most of my time, though, really is spent in clinical neurosurgery, taking care of patients, seeing patients, uh, and operating. My work is, is uh, sort of my hobby and the way I have fun and all that sort of thing. At least that's the way I feel about it. Sometimes I feel guilty because I'd hate to have to work for a living because I enjoy what I do so much. 22-year-old Carla Malone has already had some 7,000 hours of training as an apprentice welder at the Fisher Body Plant. She's six months away from becoming a journeyman or a journey person, as the case may be. Although she originally planned to be a music major at Ohio State University, her father, himself a welder for 28 years, suggested she take the apprentice exam. I didn't know anything about welding when I first came here. When I first came in the program, they assigned me to a journeyman, and he was supposed to show me what to do and everything, and he says, well, we've got this job out here at, you know, so-and-so column. And he says, let's go find a welding machine. And I said, okay. So we took off, and I didn't know what a welding machine looked like. But uh, the man that I talked to that was telling me about the program, he described the different uh, ones to me, and I decided that welding would be good. 
Can you describe what a typical day might be like for you? Well, I come in and hit the clock, and then I go over to the welding booth, and sometimes there's a job ready when we get there, sometimes there isn't, so we just have to wait for one. And uh, somebody will bring one in. Uh, I've got a job I have to do in a few minutes, and uh, it has to be preheated. It's a hard steel, and you have to preheat it so that when you weld it, it won't crack. So I preheat it, and then I weld it. Or I have to add some to this piece, and then when I'm finished welding it, I put it back in to draw some more so that it doesn't crack, and then I take it out and cool it slow. And it's just the whole day is made up of jobs like that. How do your male colleagues and superiors treat you? Well, when I first started, I think a lot of them were trying me. Like, they didn't really want me, a woman, in the program. And uh, well, run, one reason I took welding was because there wasn't any women in it. And I thought it would be fun. And uh, one of the counselors that I talked to before I came into the program said, you ought to try it because there isn't a woman in it and we'd like to see if a woman could do it. Well, that was enough for me because I knew I could do it. Carla does all right for a young woman of 22 years making $10 an hour. Well, I don't think I could go anywhere else and make as much as I am. I'm, uh, I'm young and I'm making a lot of money. I'm making as much as my father is and that makes me feel real good or pretty close to it. And although $10 an hour sounds nice, Carla claims her job as a welder is not all peaches and cream. In the summertime, being in the factory, it's, it's hot enough, and when you're welding, it's, it's about as bad as anything it's can even get. even hotter. Do you think it's more interesting than being a secretary? Definitely. I, I couldn't sit in an office all day and peck on some little keys and listen to somebody dictate a letter to me. I just couldn't do that.